Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Learning Salon. We are very excited to be here. I think this is our 61st or 62nd session. Unbelievable. Uh, we are very excited to have Team Barron's here, a uh, very uh, active uh, PI in the field for many years and also a regular of the Salon. Uh, Tim is in UK uh, time, so uh, he is in the evening. That's why you can see that he's holding a cocktail, but <laughs> otherwise <laughs> um, we might actually end a little earlier today because of the time difference also, just to make sure that Tim gets to sleep. And I just want to remind everyone, uh, this is a, a weekly forum where we discuss uh, intersections, bridges, contentions between biological and artificial learning. Um, our, your hosts uh, are us. I'm Ida Moment Najad. We have Melanie Mitchell and we have John Krakauer. And we are all very inclusive of many different disciplines here. So if you come from a discipline that you don't know something, please ask your clarification questions in the chat. If you have other questions during the talk, please leave them in the ask a question area and vote on each other's questions. And please remember that disagreements are okay as long as they're justified, uh, but disrespect is not okay. And we kind of enforce this rule of people not talking on each, over each other here, uh, partly because of the virtual format, partly because it's just good form. And uh, if you are a more junior person, grad student, postdoc, independent person that uh, are not used to asking questions, we have a long format question after the talk that Tim will give. And you're welcome to leave your questions in the ask a question area. If you don't want to be invited to screen to ask them, please just say ask for me. So I know that I wouldn't call you. If you don't say that, I might ask you in the chat if you would like to join on screen to ask it. OK, with all of that. I also want to add that um, last week was John's birthday and yesterday was mine. So it, this is a <laughs> birthday week for the salon. Happy birthday, John. And uh, yeah, with that, I'm just going to say very briefly that Tim Behrens is um, a PI at Oxford and UCL. And he has been running uh, very interesting and very impactful studies across uh, mice, uh, humans, and monkeys, as far as I know, and maybe other species that I'm not aware of. And uh, Tim has worked with many different modalities, has both methodological contributions to the field as well as scientific contributions. Um, he has been doing a lot of heavy lifting in the field of computational neuroscience when it comes to hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex, when it comes to um, cognitive maps, uh, when it comes to various kinds of executive functions. So it is especially an honor and exciting to have him here. And hopefully we will all discuss peacefully in spite of the fact that Tim and John disagree on some of the topics of today. And, uh, you know, we're going to make sure to uh, incorporate peace and fun into the discussions. <laughs> and with that, Tim, please take it away. Unless anybody else has any announcements, John, Melanie. Do just one thing. Um, it, it's it's uh, just to give you a little statement about neural control movement conference. You know, we've had a lot of you know plots in multi representational state space and dynamical systems, and um, Krishna's name came up uh, many times. Um, and I feel and, and and all many many of his trainees and collaborators. I consider myself one of those and. Um, I just like to give a shout out to Krishna Shanoi. He was a wonderful person and a wonderful scientist, and is truly going to be deeply missed. And uh, just made me sad. That's all. Okay. Amen to that. Thank um, you, yeah. Tim. Maybe you want to share your screen. Amazing scientist. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I want to share my screen. That's a good good point. Can you see that? Yes, absolutely. Perfect. Great. Uh, so, um, yeah, feel free to ask questions and interrupt on the way. Um, so I want to uh, present something called the sharing tone explanation of cognitive behavior. I'm just presenting one study. It's, um, uh, I guess, it's unusual. People come and present their big theories on, the, on Learning Salon. Uh, can you hear me? going on yeah yeah 
Okay, so uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to present one study. Uh, I'm just going to uh, start by explaining this title uh, to those people who may not have uh, followed everything on the salon uh, always. Um, and it starts uh, uh, with this uh, paper written by uh, David Barrack and John, uh, who uh, say that there's two ways to think about um, uh, uh, neuroscience of cognition, but more broadly, uh, uh, try to understand uh, what's going on in the brain. Uh, the first is uh, the, the, a Sherringtonian view. Uh, and in this Sherringtonian view, uh, I'm just going to cartoon this, John, but you need to correct me if you think I'm right or wrong. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you. Uh, the, I, the cartoon of this, of this uh, Sherringtonian view is like neurons do particular things. Uh, we understand what each neuron does and how it relates to the whole process. Um, we can maybe even draw a connection diagram describing how the neurons fit into a circuit that perform the task. Like anatomy, the leg bone connects to the hip bone, joints move around, and that's how the thing works, right? That is that is that roughly what uh, you would think is the Sherringtonian? Yes. Okay, great. Um, and the great. <laughs> uh, and, and the alternative, uh, I think, cartoon view uh, is uh, this. Uh, which is you can't learn anything from from single neurons. Uh, you have to look for higher level explainers such as manifolds or state spacing, things in state space wiggling around. Um, and if you can build uh, build principles about how those things will move around in those state spaces, uh, then you can start to understand things at that level. Um, and that's how we're gonna um, uh, and that that's how we're gonna make sense of the system, not in terms of what the neurons are doing. Right. That's I think that's. Um, uh, the second Hopfieldian view. Uh, again, you can correct me. No, I, yeah, I, I think it's you know what's the right epistemological object to get intuitions and understanding. Yeah, uh, and it can't, and, it, and it, neurons aren't always going to be the winner, no matter what you're trying to explain. Excellent. Okay, so um, and, and then the overarching thesis of this uh, paper is that cognitive papers will ev only ev cognitive behaviors will only ever make sense at this Hopfieldian level right this level where we uh, abstract above the neurons um uh and so uh this is a view that is espoused by John and has many other people uh, I think would take this view that you uh can basically ignore neurons if you're interested in cognition that's a, a bigger cartoon um uh so um let me just try to give uh, a more uh, like a uh, um, diagrammatic view of the Sherringtonian thing or an exemplar. Uh, here's, I, I think John would agree that this is, this is like the, the paradigmatic uh, Sherringtonian style thing. It's like a machine uh, where I, it has some parts that, are, that have cogs that are moving together. Um, and uh, this one is playing music, uh, right? And so um, uh, it has a cylinder, and the cylinder's got bumps of uh, bumps of uh, um, little bumps on it that go round and twang those forks um, and play a song. Uh, and we know what all the pieces are. We know how they fit together uh, to achieve function. Is that right? Agreed. Uh, we are muted, John. John, I can't hear you. Oh, no, yeah, yes, exactly. You, you, you can sort of follow the compositional logic of the pieces and actually almost sort of infer how it will work by thinking about exactly. the bits. Exactly. Yes. Okay, right. So John and David say this is how you can't understand uh, cognition. You have to understand cognition up in some high dimensional space. Right. I uh, would like that not to be true. I don't know if it's true or not, uh, but today I'm going to try and present an example uh, where we think we've understood something about what the frontal cortex has done in a way that's a little bit like this music box, right? So it's like we understand how the pieces fit together, um, uh, those pieces of neurons, and we understand all of that. And I'd like just to, obviously, um, uh, obviously this is... Uh, I, this this is obviously not going to solve everything, but it is um, uh, open for debate whether uh, maybe it will 
maybe it'll uh, push the needle one way or another and make you think about what we can achieve in terms of explanatory power. Great. Okay. So um, uh, we define, I think, what we mean by Sherringtonian quite well now. Um, and so uh, the next question is, uh, what do we mean by cognitive? Um, and I think this is a lot harder. And so we're just going to have to agree on whether this thing is cognitive or not. Um, and so I'm going to need some more input from John here. So I'm going to explain the first explain the behavior that we're going to try uh, to understand. Just to say that this Tim, work I is just, done I don't by want to you before you start, but just David Barak is actually here, I believe, because I saw him in the yeah, they, chat. And so um, very much when we come to the um, conversation right, yeah. section, I very much would like I don't I don't want to speak for him. Um, and it's great that he's here. Um, so uh, that's what I want to say. Let's leave that for after the talk is over, because yes. I feel like yeah. this is a first time we're having a back and forth during a talk, Tim. Usually the talk goes on and then, but uh, totally yeah, okay. Well, but I feel like let's keep longer conversations for after. Yeah. Okay, but we can have yes, no's from John. Okay, so we, we have it, we have because we, we have to get John to agree that, or David, someone to agree whether this is cognitive or not. Okay. Yes, no's are perfectly <laughs> fine. <laughs> Uh, awesome. Okay, so um, I, I'm going to say as well, Mohamedi El Gebi and, uh, and Adam Hammer, ha Harris have acquired this data, and Mohamedi's most of the analysis of it. So uh, it's really a lot, mostly uh, Mohamedi's ideas. Um, uh, this is the task. Uh, so here is an animal uh, who has to go to four locations in a row uh, to get a reward. A, B, C, D. You can see it here. He's very good at it. He's going from A to B. Uh, to C to D, uh, and then back to A. Each one of those towers that you can see uh, will only deliver a reward uh, if it's visited in the, in the correct sequence, right? And so that A tower won't deliver a, a reward in the wrong order, uh, but it will deliver a reward if it's given directly after the D, and then the B after the A, and the C after the B, etc. And the animal learns to go to four places in a row uh, to get a reward. So that sounds reasonably cognitive, uh, but I'm going to try and make it sound even more cognitive uh, by telling you this. This is um, the animal on the very, very first trial that he's ever seen the, the rewards in this location. Um, and you can see, I'm just cutting in uh, shortly before he finds A. Uh, he can't know where any of the rewards are because the rewards have never been in this location before. right? And so he's going to get lost. Uh, here he he he, he uh, so B is there and I, I'm just going to fast forward it a little bit. He gets he, go, he goes the wrong way to B, and and then he goes the wrong way to C, and then he's going to go. He's going to get very lost finding D. But there's one thing he can do if he's clever because he's seen this structure of task A B C D many times before, even though the rewards have been in different locations. And so the clever thing that he can do, I'm just cutting, I'm just pausing it now before he gets to D, is after he can, after he finds D, if he knows there are going to be four things in this structure, in this task schema, uh, then uh, he can know the next one's A, which he's only ever sampled once before, and he's never taken the route between D and A before. And so what he's going to do is he's going to take the fastest route back from D and he's, he knows it's A, he's going to go directly to A uh, from D. Here he goes, taking, to, taking the process right to A. That's the first time he's ever taken that transition, and he's got it right because he knows that there were four things in a row, right? Um, so this is um, obviously a very difficult behavior to work with because you only get one trial per experiment. But nevertheless, think, if you do this... I'm, sorry, I, I'm interrupting. Just, I, I found it a little hard to follow. It's a little hard with the black and white, and then our names are over the top of it. Um, can oh, you just sorry. explain, in other words, just so I know, the original, and I'm sure other people, so just can you just point the, the original, if I understand it, the lower right-hand target is the beginning of the original sequence. Is that right? Uh, yeah, the lower... So exactly, the lower right-hand target is the first one he finds. And, and, and he, he learns the structure A, B, so he goes left, then up to the middle. And so no. Just, so what is it? So, so just explain exactly what he has to do, what he's learned. 
what he's learned is nothing to do with the locations. Uh, what he's learned in the abstract is nothing to do with locations. He's learned there will be four rewarded things in a row, and then I have to repeat that, those four rewarded things in a row. And the mm -hmm. way that he's revealed that is when he's given, when he's, when he's shown four new rewarded locations in this new location, he could, he could never find those. He could never know where those are. So he has to go and find those and discover them. But the moment he finds the fourth one, he returns to the first one straight away. I see. So in other words, he, he basically knows. And, and why would, just to understand, so, and so in other words, your point is that he knew the rule of four, basically. He knew that there was going to be four. He knew he had to remember the first one and then go back to it and then and uh, after four and remember the second one and then go back to that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. Great. Exactly. Okay, cool. Awesome. Is that clear for everybody else as well? Yeah. Okay. So, th so this is kind of a complicated um, behavior uh, to, um, uh, to play with uh, because uh, every time you change the rewards up, you get one trial because it has to be a zero shot. You have to, you have to prove this. He's, he's got this. You have to only study the first trial where he goes back from D to A. Anything after that could be learning, not rather than like inference, which is what he's done there. Yeah. But nevertheless, even though you only get one trial per experiment, this on average works in every mouse we've ever tested it on. Here are all the mice. Um, and so what I'm plotting here is the proportion of times they return to the uh, to A by the shortest route uh, following D on up here versus following B or C, uh, which would be the wrong number, which wouldn't be a rule of four, right? And so um, uh, you can see that every mouse returns following D uh, more often uh, than following B or C. And so they're able to execute this, uh, this schema, this uh, understanding of, the, of a rule of four. So I'm going to argue that that's like a, a schema of a task. They've understood not the locations of all the rewards. They've understood the structure of the task. Um, uh, uh, so just for those people here who don't know what a schema is, a schema is like an abstract understanding of a task which permits rapid learning or inferences in new examples, right? And so that's what they've done there. They've understood that this task is an A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A task. Um, that means that when they see a new example of that task, um, they can immediately do that inference on the very first trial, right? Uh, so th these schemas are pervasive in human life. Uh, they're per pervasive in the life of every animal. Um, they're what let you control your behaviors and be reasonable. So like, for example, if you go into a restaurant, you know what you should do in a restaurant. You understand how restaurants work. You know you have to sit down and order before the food arrives. You when the bill up, when the bill comes, you know the, that it, it's paying for the food. These are this is all a rich schema of what a restaurant is. Your talk schema tells you that this boring text is going to be replaced by some amazing data in a minute. You know how talks work. You know that the uh, that there's going to be an introduction, then some, then some data, and then some conclusions. Right? You, you know what to expect. This animal knows what to expect. The mouse. He knows to expect four things in a, row, in a row, and that lets him do an inference over something he's never seen before. Uh, these, there are lots of studies of schemas in humans. Uh, here's one of my favorite from Princeton, um, uh, Chris Baldassano, um, showing uh, just a really clean example of contrasting people in a airport schema versus people in a restaurant schema. Uh, and even though the, all the sensory stuff are controlled, et cetera, the, 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 there are parts of the brain, the most sophisticated parts of the brain, are understanding the narrative effectively, um, and uh, and similar schemas have similar representations uh, in these kinds of brain areas. I'm going to focus here on the medial frontal cortex. All right, John. So is that a cognitive behavior? Because if it is, then we can move on. Uh, yes. I mean, I, I I I just one thing. There are two strands here. One is it a cognitive behavior? Yes. Is there more than one way to do it? Is the question we'll talk ah, about later. Fun. Excellent. 
that's going to be good. Right, there is more than one way to do it, in fact. I'll tell you that before we talk about it later. Oh, what happened there? Did you lose? Ah. I think maybe my script, I pressed Q or something. So let's try this one more time. Yeah, uh, just share again. Have we lost Melanie? As we have we lost Melanie? No, no, Melanie turned off her camera to clear the screen a little bit. Okay, awesome. Right, good. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to record in that task and we're going to record from the uh, area that is uh, most homologous in a mouse uh, to that medial frontal area I showed you in a human, uh, which is the prelimbic cortex of a mouse. Uh, and we're going to try to um, uh, play those games. Uh, and this is, uh, yeah, again, done by Mohammedi and Adam and Tom Akam there. Uh, great. Okay, so like, here's one way you could solve this task. Um, and we've worked on this kind of um, models for this kind of uh, way before, you could maintain a purely abstract representation of the task structure ABCD in neurons, you could have one neuron for A, one for B, one for C, one for D. Um, and then you could also maintain some neurons that know about space like place cells, for example. And then when a new task comes along, uh, you could bind uh, your abstract A with the physical location of that A um, uh, and uh, the abstract B with the physical location of that B. You can bind that on the very first trial and then you'll think, oh, I've got to D. I can move forward in the abstract space and say, okay, that's that one. Where's that in physical space? Uh, go to A, okay, I can uh, make that um, make that move, um, and that would solve the task. That's one way to solve the task. And then if you, when the task switches, what you have to do is make some new synapses here, uh, such that the same task abstraction binds to new um, uh, sense, to new physical locations, to new play cells. Uh, that's how we thought the task would be solved. Um, and indeed, the reason we thought that is because um, that's how a number of abstraction tasks are solved in the brain. Um, here's a, a schematic of the hippocampal formation, uh, which is uh, arguably solving the task a little bit like that. Uh, it has some abstraction over here, like a context or a schema. Uh, this is Howard Eichenbaum's uh, description. These might be grid cells, for example, if you are thinking about an abstraction for space. Um, over here in the uh, lateral entorhinal area, it has something that it's going to uh, put at those locations, uh, like um, like some objects or whatever. And then uh, it does this binding in the hippocampus, uh, where you put the um, objects at particular locations uh, in the um, in the uh, uh, the spatial or the abstract coordinate system. Um, so that's a sort of functional schematic of how people think hippocampus works. Uh, given to us by Howard Eichenbaum 15 years ago. Um, and indeed, you can build that kind of model, and I'm not going to go into this, but if you build that kind of model, uh, then it learns, uh, and you ask what's the optimal schematic representation for space, for example, uh, then it learns all the representations that you can see in the entorhinal cortex, so grid cells, border cells, object vector cells. So this, in some sense, is a schema. It's a schema for how to navigate around space. Um, and um, it works in that same way that I was talking about before. Uh, if you go and then look at these memory cells, uh, you see, uh, so that's these are the, the abstraction cells up here, which are in the entorhinal cortex. If you go and look at these memory cells that do the bind, uh, just a little bit uh, later, you see uh, place cells and landmark cells and things that you'd see in the hippocampus. Right, okay. So that's uh, one way that you might build a task schema. You can assume that the, there's a pure abstraction that is what we call factored away from the sensory input, right? There's not that they all of the sensory stuff just gets bound uh, to the uh, to the abstraction. That's one way. Uh, here's another way that people have thought of building uh, task schemas. Um, this is uh, from DeepMind, from Zeb, Kurt Nelson, Jane Wang, uh, Matt Botvinnik. Um, and they said, well, you could just a neural network to build a task schema. In some senses, this oh, this this seems uh, like a silly thing to say now with all these large language models 
around like obviously they've built a task schema for 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 language that you can give them one example and they don't need training on that example they can answer it because they've answered because they've built the statistical structure of language into their system uh, and zev and zev and jane made this point a while ago about about reinforcement learning you can learn the structure of a task and embed it in the dynamics of a recurrent neural network uh, such that you get these zero shot inferences for free um, and so they call that meta reinforcement learning um, and that's um, an alternative way of doing it instead of having new synapses that bind an abstraction uh, to uh, to a physical space you can just build the whole solution effectively the inverse model of this problem directly into the dynamics uh, of your recurrent neural network again that seems like a uh, great thing to do uh, but again it's it, it, it you don't it, like that gives you a sort of meta understanding of what the brain is doing you never really understand in these recurrent neural networks just literally how one neuron passes to the other how those dynamics are encoded um, and so uh, we set out to ask, well, is there a factored abstraction like the Tolman Eichenbaum machine in the frontal cortex, or is there a dynamic solution like this recurrent neural network? And if there is one or the other, which will turn out to be a dynamic one, uh, then um, can we understand exactly how those dynamics work? That's the, that's the challenge that we want to do. All right, awesome. Uh, good. Um, Here's the setup. We have this task that I um, explained to you before. I'm hoping everybody can remember it now because John made me clarify with such, um, which with so so uh, so kindly. Um, the the animals get extraordinarily good at this. They get so good at this that we can give them we can give them four tasks in a day, right? So like they just do a task, they get. To 80% good at that task, they give them another task, 80% good at that task, et cetera, et cetera, four in a day. In between each of those tasks, we stick them in a little bucket so they can go to sleep for 10, 15 minutes. Um, and then uh, we give them another task. Uh, the critical thing is that task, one critical thing is that task X and task Y and task Z uh, have, uh, there's nothing about one of them that can predict where the rewards are going to be in the other one. All of the rewards are orthogonal to each other. We're just randomly selected on each one. But task X prime here will have rewards in the same location as task X over here so that we can check whether we can measure the same thing twice to see if we're reproducible, right? That's, uh, that's the setup. Is that clear, Ida, John? I guess I'm, I guess, yeah, cool. Awesome. Different structures, um, same location of reward. No, same task structure, different locations of rewards. Got Always it. Always A, B, C, D. Yeah. Always A, B, C, D, different locations each time, except for X and X prime, which are the same. Yeah, okay, awesome. Cool. I'm going. I'm. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to first describe in a very descriptive way the properties, the the major properties of the cells, and then I'm going to um, try to try to convince you of how uh, they fit together uh, in a um, uh, in in a Sheringtonian way to produce the behavior. All right. Okay. So here's the first property of the cell and this is i think um well so what this cell does is it fires when you are a particular percentage of the way towards a sub goal any of the sub goals this one fires when you're about 85 percent of the way uh, to the next reward it's like a place cell uh, but in reward in sub goal space right so on every trial on, on every one of those a b c d's it just fires when you're about 85 percent there no matter where you are in space uh, i can plot it like this it fires 75 80 percent of the way to a 80 percent of the way to b 80 percent of the way to c 
80% of the way to D. This one fires at 80% of the way, but there are other cells that fire at 0%, 50%, 10%, 90%. 90%. These cells form a map like place fields, not of physical space, uh, but of where you are in your current goal, right? That's the first thing uh, to do. Um, though these cells are um, uh, unusual for me, having studied frontal cortex for a while. Normally, if you study frontal cortex for a while, uh, you find um, that 15% of your cells uh, respond to this and 12% of your cells respond to that. And maybe if it's value, it's 18% of your cells, not 12. This property of phase coding or, or like task progress coding, whatever you want to call it, is uh, in is is true of 80%, 80% of all frontal, medial frontal cells. This is the basic property that describes the frontal re um, recording, the, re the frontal response in this task. I, I've never seen anything like that in the frontal cortex before. Right, okay, so 80% of cells have this phase coding. Here are the loads of cells showing this phase coding. They tile the whole space. Here on the one left, left hand side is one reward. On the next side is the other, is the next reward. Uh, and you can see them tiling the space like this, uh, like cells would, but they're not tiling space, they're tiling progress towards your goal. Right, great. Uh, you can see that that is non trivial uh, because uh, looking at this setup here, uh, the distance between uh, A and B is a long way, uh, but the distance between B and C is a short way, uh, but nevertheless this green neuron uh, will code 50% of the way between A and B in both, and 50% of the way between B and C. Uh, so he, uh, there's some intricate transformation that's happened between physical space and some abstraction like, like task progress. Right? That's, that's one um, thing to, th to know about these cells. Uh, these things. Is that, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I'm just, is that the same cell? In other words, is that what you mean? That that the same cell will always code fifty percent of the way. Will code fifty percent regardless of the distance being twice the distance Indeed. or whatever. In other words, it's in it's in goal. It's completely in goal space. Exactly correct. Right. Okay. The same. Exactly correct. Yeah. The, the same green cell fires halfway between A and B and B and C, despite the fact it's half the distance, exactly. That's number one. That's property number one. Uh, that generalizes across tasks. You could have predicted that because it even generalizes across sub goals. It generalizes across everything, right? This is like sorting on one task and then plotting the other task. It works fine. Great. Of those 80% of cells, which are phase tuned, Half of them are also state tuned. So that means that they've still got these four peaks, but the four peaks are not the same height. So that you could uh, decode from these cells, not just where you are in the sub goal, uh, but also which sub goal uh, you're part of, right? Where are you in the outer loop, the ABCD sequence? Right, you, so you can see that here, here are a bunch of cells that we're going to call state cells. Uh, they know where you are in the ACD loop. Uh, and you can see uh, here uh, that this one here is not a place cell because look at these four lobes. These four lobes fire at different physical locations. One fires in B, one fires in A, uh, one fires, I don't know, somewhere in D or somewhere down here. Right, so they're not place cells. This one is not a place cell. Uh, it's a state cell. Uh, it cares about uh, when you're in B, uh, and it also cares about what phase you're at. Those are the two things that are affecting it, right? So 80% of the cells care about phase, and of those, half of the cells are state cells. 40% of the cells are state cells. Great. Great. So it feels like we're there for, for the pure abstraction solution. The only thing that we would 
need for this solution would be for this state cell B in one task to also code for B in another task, right? And then you have like an, a ring attractor or something uh, that, uh, uh, that codes for this abstract uh, ring and Bob's your uncle, all you have to do is like synaptically bind it to place cells. Uh, and that is a solution to this problem, a little bit like the Tolman Eichenbaum machine or like how the hippocampus solves the spatial problem. Right. So is that true? Do we get generalization? Um, and the answer is uh, no, not trivially. So you can see that here. Here is a cell that in one task uh, fires uh, halfway between D and A. In this task, fires halfway between A and B. Uh, in this next task, fires halfway between B and C. And then crucially, you'll notice when you put the rewards back in the same location, it fires in exactly the same place uh, between D and A uh, as it did before, right? So this task is, is this cell is like remapping. It's not, it's remapping in task space, um, but it's uh, stable. Um, and uh, this is true of all of our cells. What I'm plotting here is the angle uh, between this guy here um, and this guy here. Um, and you can see that that angle is zero, right? But I'm plotting that as a histogram for all of my cells. And you can see that this is an incredibly reproducible set of data. I record it twice, and the histogram only really has a peak at zero. I measure the same thing again when I measure it, right? That's number one. But if I then plot the angle between this guy and Y or Z, uh, I, it looks totally random. You can see that it ha that it's the histogram is all on the cardinal axes uh, because the phase is preserved, as I showed you before. And so if it's a halfway cell, it's always a halfway cell. Uh, but um, uh, but uh, the um, uh, but the state which it's in, you cannot predict which state it's going to be in uh, from one task to the next. Totally random. I'm just, I'm sorry, yeah, just for so clarification. Um, I'm just trying to understand. Is it is the it, it is it be is it truly random or is it random across tasks but consistent within task? if it were to be asked to do that task again. I'm just trying to understand. It's consistent within, if you ask, if you give it the same task again, it gives, this is a top plot. If you give it the same task again, you measure exactly the same thing again. If you move to a new task, you measure something different, right? So it's not random, it's explainable, but the, the thing that generalizes is not this abstract state, can't be, because otherwise we put zero, we get we get zero there. There's something else underlying this randomness, which I'm going to explain to you what it is in a minute. So you were halfway there. As in what? The, the As result. In my talk. No, no. You, the result you would really have liked would have been if it was the same state stable across days, right? If this, if it was the same state stable across time that would have suggested there's a pure abstraction in frontal cortex a b c d abstraction that's that would have been very simple beautiful result it would, it would be a very simple result arguably less beautiful than the result that i'm going to show you later but a very simple result nevertheless um uh and it would have been exactly like the tom and eichenbaum machine would do it for example or how the entorhinal cortex would do it exactly yeah just a reminder, maybe five to ten more minutes for the talk so we can move on the to the is not next be phase, given that John isn't has isn't going to be interesting unless I finish the talk. So we'll just see how long we go. <laughs> yeah, cool. yeah, exactly. I was yeah. just trying to make it clear for everyone. It's but, a little bit, I, I wasn't trying to interrupt so much. It's either. extremely it's complicated. It's extremely yeah. complicated. It's important to go slow. You totally should, agree. You should definitely, definitely totally agree. pause me. It's, it's not, the, it's not. The, 100%. Most we'll people, do that. We yeah. will do that, most, but just. Yeah. Mindful of time, ten more minutes, maybe. Uh, yeah, people don't have a schema for this kind of data because it's not like any other data that people have that I've that I that we present very often. Yeah, exactly. You've got to go slow. Good. Okay. Right. So here's another thing that could have happened. Instead of them, those those um, 
just measuring the same state each time, maybe like the grid cells do, grid cells rotate between between different worlds. Maybe this whole abstract task map rotates between different worlds, right? That's possible, right? And so you could imagine this blue neuron here that was at A moving to B, like I just showed you, but then the whole map moving with it, right? Like this, something like this, and then that could have happened. So let's go into the neurons, and, and if that had happened, then we're fine again. Now, now it's a pure abstraction. It's just rotated. I don't know where A is. Right? That's that that could have happened, right? So let's have a look and see if that happened. Um, and so here's two neurons that were recorded at the same time, and you can see uh, here that those two ro rotated with ninety degrees. They rotated ninety degrees. All was good. Those two rotated together, um, uh, and that's true in the whole population but it's kind of like craply true this is not can't be what really explains everything right it's significant like to a p of 0.05 or something but you can see chances here at like at like uh point uh, like eight percent and maybe we can explain like 15 percent of the data this way not a satisfying thing something else is going on as well as some coherent rotation, right? And what else is going on, you can see here, here's another neuron that was recorded at the same time. Uh, this neuron, um, uh, you can see it's different because when these guys are rotating by 90 degrees, this neuron is staying, is staying the same place, right? And so uh, this guy uh, is not rotating with the other guys. Um, and you can see that uh, here are two other neurons that are that are uh, not that are staying in the same place as well. And so there's a second cluster of neurons that seem to be like attached to each other, rotating together. Here's two clusters, and I can show you um, from a time when many neurons were recorded together that there are in fact many clusters of neurons that coherently rotate together uh, between tasks. So uh, this is the final descriptive. Uh, slide of the data before I tell you how the thing works. Um, this, um, uh, what you can see here is all of the neurons that started in A, in ta this is task X, all of the neurons in, in A uh, were uh, are black. And you can see in task Y, in this cluster of neurons down here, all the black ones moved to C. But in this cluster, all the black ones that were at A moved to B. These ones would be as well. Uh, these ones stayed at A. Um, and then in task Z, again, uh, they rotated differently, a little bit like some kind of combination lock uh, with different um, uh, neuro with different rings of neurons rotating between tasks uh, somehow to encode the task. I'm going to give you one further piece of evidence uh, that these things are independent rings that are rotating with respect to each other. Um, and that evidence uh, is here. Uh, and it's a um, uh, some sharp ripples uh, that we uh, can record in the um, uh, it, it, in the sleep periods, and then you can see these kinds of things, which are like reverse replays A, D, C, B. Uh, but you can only uh, you can only see them uh, if you look. So this is like a reverse replay in task space, not physical space. Uh, but you can only see them uh, if you look in cells that are part of the same cluster, not if you look across clusters, right? So that means uh, that means as an independent independent uh, validation that those clusters are really uh, separate things that are able to rotate uh, independently from each other. That is the end of the uh, description of the data, uh, and the and and the, we've I think pretty much proven that it's not a single abstract ring A B C D right, um, that is then bound to space somehow. Uh, so what could it be? Um, and the answer is, oh, and the answer is, uh, here's another way of encoding a sequence. Uh, this is a, um, a music box. Um, and this music box, I think we agree, uh, can be described in a sort of Sherringtonian way. I've got one here. So this is, what it's doing is it's encoding a sequence of notes. And it's encoding that sequence of notes uh, via bumps uh, on a cylinder. Uh, so I can uh, just, I don't know if you can see, I've got one here. It goes, 
this one's playing a, a song called Memory. Um, and uh, and you can see that what's happening is these bumps are moving round uh, and they're moving round uh, to hit um, a location in, in this case, in music space, right? But what they encode is a sequence of, of notes, a little bit like the sequence of locations uh, that our animals execute. The only, um, the only uh, thing that is different about encoding a sequence in a memory, uh, in a music box uh, versus a schema is that you can't change the sequence that you want to encode unless you've got a programmable music box, uh, which is one of these. Uh, this is a programmable music box, uh, which, um, uh, which uh, is programmable because I can move those bumps, right? Can you see uh, that those bumps, instead of being fixed locations, can now be moved with respect to each other? Well, I've got one of those here as well. I don't know if that that is visible on on Zoom or something, but uh, let me just see if this works. This is uh, this this is the frontal cortex here, um, and you can um, you can see that if I when I turn this around, the bumps of activity uh, on this music box um, play a, a song. Can you hear it? Playing Old MacDonald, right? And so what's happening is these bumps are hitting, uh, are hitting these uh, notes uh, in the same, uh, in, in the, in the same um, order, right? Uh, but the thing is, if I just move where the bumps go, uh, then, I can, um, then I can change the order of the sequence. I can change the song. Um, and, but, but the song will always have the same length, for example, length four, A, B, C, D, right? So that's uh, that's a, a music box, um, and what I'm about to show you is that those neurons are parts of ring attractors, uh, which make up a music box exactly like that. Cool. All right. Uh, so how do you uh, how would you uh, prove that? Uh, how would you um, how would you uh, make up a, a music box in neurons? Well, you can see there that you need some rings. A little bit like the rings I showed you that were moving around beforehand in the neurons, uh, you can you need some uh, some rings, um, and each ring has to have an a has to uh, a pass activity around that ring uh, like an attractor. Um, so you can see these rings here. I'm just going to take a look at one of those rings, um, and it's going to have some neurons. Uh, and th so this neuron here is the neuron that actually hits the note. It's the readout neuron. And after, if you can imagine this thing, this, this thing here, uh, it's going to carry on the activity. After it hits the note, this ring is going to carry on going round, and the activity is going to go around the back of this thing. It's not playing a note anymore. It's just kind of waiting, and it's going to carry on going round this music box until it hits the note again next time round. So like they've just like delayed activity saying I'm not don't play the note now 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 and it just carries on going around this music box until it hits the note again that's uh, that that's a, a ring of, that's an, that's how an attractor works so an attractor can hold activity and it can hold activity in a bump that goes round and round and round and round until it hits the thing again right and so uh, if I had one of those rings I could just set it off when I got to a location or if I hit uh, a, the note, and then it can carry on going around the ring. And then when you get back to that location in a task, uh, it can hit the note again. Bong, like that, right? And so that's, let's say I had uh, loads of those, um, those attractors, uh, then I could encode a sequence. Right, uh, so let's just uh, quickly, uh, quickly, just remind people who aren't following. Uh, this is the cell, the readout cell from this ring. Um, it fires when you um, uh, when you uh, actually play the note. But over on the back of the music box, there's another cell that fires when the bump is halfway around a full lo lo location, like when you're two sub goals away, like 20 seconds away from coming back uh, 
uh, to the start of to, to where you came back to, uh, there's a cell that fires and says, oh, I'm going to be there in 20 seconds, right? It's like a lagged play cell, yeah, on the back of the music box. I feel like maybe I'm being unclear, but maybe people sort of get the picture at least. Um, uh, and then, uh, and so, um, so it's like a sort of last play cell. It's saying, okay, uh, sometime in the future, uh, two rewards in the future, in fact, uh, you're going to go and get a reward from that location. All right, uh, so here's, the, here's a, a summary. Um, each ring has an anchor, each which is like the, the note, uh, or in, my, in our case, the physical location. Um, each neuron is part of a ring that has a lag, uh, they're lagged play cells, and then the whole music box just goes round and round and round and round and round. And round. Uh, then um, uh, then uh, it just plays out the sequence uh, like, uh, like, a, like a sequence of notes. Cool. And then when you want to play a new sequence, you just put new bumps in the same attractors. You don't have to change any synapses. Uh, you just put new activity uh, in the um, in this in the attractors. So if this is true, uh, then we can make some predictions. Oh, uh, one other thing. Yeah, what are the anchors? In that case, uh, the anchors were uh, were notes, right? This is this is I'm playing a sequence of notes. In our case, uh, <clears throat> one solution would just be to have the anchors as a location, so you could play a sequence of locations. The brain, the the solution that the brain finds is slightly more complicated than that. Uh, we can discuss it uh, later. Um, the solution that we, um, uh, the brain finds is that the anchors are uh, the locations multiplied by this phase, effectively, which means um, that you have a different attractor for when you uh, visit a location and get a reward uh, versus when you get a when you visit a location when you're just walking through it. I can uh, I can go into that in the discussion if people are interested in that. Uh, it is good for lots and lots of things that little division. But if you're confused, then just imagine the anchors are physical locations, uh, just like and they're just like notes <coughs> in the music box. And if you're uh, want to play a sequence of locations, uh, then you can code uh, just like playing a sequence of notes with the music box. Awesome. Uh, so here's uh, here's a, a cell. Uh, that's recorded, and this cell that I'm about to show you uh, is about here on the music box. This is location A, um, and uh, this cell is about here on the back, on the about one and a half rewards round. So it's going to play about one and a half rewards uh, after um, uh, after you visit that location. Remember, I'm saying they're lagged play cells. So if I uh, visit that location, it won't fire when I visit it, but it will fire when the music box has got round uh, to one and a half rewards later. Um, and you can see it here. So here I, I visit a location here, and then one and a half rewards later, it's active. This is in task one. Uh, in task two, uh, I visit it here, and then one and a half rewards later, it's maximally active. And then in task three, I visit the location here, and then, uh, oh, and then one and a half rewards later, oh God. Uh, one and a half rewards later, it's maximally active, right? So it's always active about 10 seconds, of, about five seconds, five to 10 seconds after you uh, visit the reward, one and a half rewards later. It's a lagged play cell, but it's lagged in task space. All right, okay. So what I could do if I was clever is I could figure out those anchors. Here's, here's this cell just plotted the same way I've plotted the other cells. But I could I could figure out this um, the anchor for this cell, and I could say if I figure out the anchor, it should all point in the same way. One, two, three, four, five. They're all pointing the same way because I know which location that it's a lag play cell for. And so in the different tasks, okay, the animal passes through that location in different places, but it's always invariant with respect to when the animal passed through that location, right? Because it's a lagged uh, place cell. Tim, can I ask I can a very quick it? one? Very quick yeah. one. Isn't this like perspective memory cell? Uh, is it like a perspective memory cell? I don't, I don't know is the answer. Okay, um, I'll explain later. I, I am in a discussion. Yeah, maybe we can discuss later. So, but I'm just gonna show the whole population now, but I'm not gonna analyze it in a manifold. I'm gonna analyze every single cell 
separately and show that they're all these lag place cells because I'm going to try and fit those anchors to five of those tasks. And then I'm going to, in the sixth task, I'm going to try and predict exactly where it's going to fire before I even do any recording. And I'm going to ask, did the cell fire at that place where I predicted it was going to fire without, uh, before I did recording? And remember when I could do that, it, I, I was good at predicting when I'd recorded the whole thing before, when I recorded X versus X prime, I can predict exactly when the cell is going to fire. I can't predict it at all if I do it X versus Y. But if I fit the anchor and try and work out, given the new rewards, where should it fire on this new task, uh, then I can do quite well, right? So here we can predict roughly where 80% of the cells are going to fire very precisely uh, based on, uh, on based on fitting the anchor and assuming part of one of these music boxes, right? So this is like totally held out data, and it's like something that you can't, it's very hard, for example, to do with hippocampal remapping. You can never predict where a play cell is going to fire in a new environment. But here, because you know where the anchors are, and because they're all these, because they're anchors part of this, um, uh, this music box, uh, these ring these ring attractors, uh, you can figure out where the thing's going to fire. Cool. Okay. These are the distribution of lags. You can see that there are loads of cells that fire locally whenever the animal moves past a place, but there are loads of cells that fire throughout this music box. And the cells over here uh, are firing like three rewards later, like 20 seconds later. I'll just whip through the last three or four slides They're very quick, and then we can uh, stop. Um, yeah, these guys over here are firing three rewards later. They're firing like 10, 15 seconds after the animal's been there. Okay, so what Okay, what if you want to go through the same anchor twice in a sequence? Well, no problem. In Old MacDonald, you can do that no problem. You hit the same, same note twice, dum, dum, dum. That just means you need to put two bumps of activity in the ring instead of one. Um, and so you can look at this. Here's a couple of plots that show this is true. If you look at um, untuned cells, cells that haven't got state tuning, that's because in that task, they never visited the anchor, right? So if I, if I, if I didn't go to the anchor at that task, then the cell doesn't become tuned, right? So it's part of a ring that's anchored to a location. If I plot the number of times in every trial that I went to the anchor, and then the number of peaks, you saw some of those some of those cells had one peak, some had two peaks, some had three peaks. The reason they had two peaks uh, was because they went the behavior went through the anchor twice, uh, just like in old McDonald, it plays the the middle C dum dum dum. That's three peaks uh, in the uh, in the um, in the cell, right? And so you can see that that holds uh, in this data. Uh, this one uh, is a fun little result. So in that um, uh, in that uh, zero shot trial that I showed you, um, uh, the animal had to remember where A was. Remember back to the very start of the talk, the animal had to remember where A was. I can look just at those zero shot, shot trials, but now I know where all the anchors are. I know which of those neurons is an is anchored to the to that A location, and which was anchored to B, and which is not anchored to any of the reward locations on this task, right? <coughs> If I look at the ones anchored to A, then on the trials where they complete zero shot, those guys are firing loads. And when they don't complete the zero shot, they're not firing, as if, as if they never put the bump of activity in that ring attractor, right? Whereas neurons that are, that are aligned to B, C, and D, uh, they don't have that difference. And so they're, they're not relevant for the A zero shot. Uh, this last, I'm not going to, I realize I'm running out of time. This, this, thing, this, this thing says, because you can look at the back of the music box, you can predict where the animal's going to, you can predict routes the animal's going to take like 15 seconds before it's, he's going to take that, 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 that route uh, by looking at which, uh, which ring has got more activity in on the back of the music box. Um, I'm not going to show you the data because uh, Ida's getting angsty. Um, uh, yeah, but that's the, I'm just I'm just going to show you. One. No, please do show us. Don't do show I, I, us. This. Gonna, 
I mean, like, it's a regression. It says, look at the back of the music. I'm going to regress on the back of the music box cells, not the cells that are about the decision now, but the decision later. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to predict where, which route the animal is going to take to get the reward. Is he going to take, for example, that route or that route to get to the reward? And I can predict that by saying, okay, is this is the attractor on the is the cell on the back of the music box for this red guy? Is that got more activity in than the cell on the back of the music box for this green guy? Uh, and I can just do a regression to compare those two things, and I can use that to predict whether the animal is going to take this route, uh, the, the orange route or the yellow route to the reward. But I can predict it like Mohammed can predict it like. 15 seconds before the animal's taking it, before he's e the animal's even going from A to B, right? Because in the, on the back of the music box, the animal's still in C and D, right? He's in a totally different location, doing a totally different thing. But there's some cells going, well, in two rewards time, you'll be going between A and B. This will be the route you're going to take. Yep. Okay, cool. All right, uh, excellent. And that regression, this is that regression showing that. Okay, last thing I want to show you because Habiba's here and this is cool. Here is another, oh, I was, here is one more cell that looks exactly like all the other cells that I've showed you. It has all the properties. It has um, phase tuning and it has state tuning and it remaps between different uh, tasks, exactly like all those cells I've shown before. But this cell, is not recorded in a mice in a mouse doing uh, in a mouse prelimbic cortex. It's recorded in a human pregenual cortex in that same area that I showed you the schema in the in the start. This, the mice take days to weeks to learn this complicated representation. It looks as though the humans can build this complicated music box representation in four minutes when they read the instructions. That's a pretty cool thing if that turns out to be true um and uh like the preliminary very preliminary data is suggestive and the other amazing thing that habib has done is this these are some cells in the entorhinal cortex not in the uh, prefrontal cortex medial prefrontal cortex and these cells you can see this cell you can see always seems to like the same state just like that other kind of abstraction, the pure abstraction, or the or the grid cells, or the Tolman Eichenbach machine. So you can decode the state from one task to another, just like you can decode space across grid cells. Um, and so this, from very very preliminary data, suggests that the entorhinal cortex has that other kind of task abstraction, not the music box, the same one as the grid cell like ta task abstraction, but at the same time as the frontal cortex has got the music box going on. And that's all I have to say, apart from to thank you, Mohammedi and Adam and Tom, Akam and um, Habiba, and you guys for listening to a very complicated talk where I try to explain a cognitive behavior in Sherringtonian terms. I'll use manifolds next time, it'll be easier. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you so much. Um, might have been our longest talk on the salon ever. <laughs> All right. uh, John has a hard stop in 50 minutes, but I'm hoping that we can have a good conversation uh, and we can have all the questions that are popping up in the Ask a Question area as well. Um, so with that, I, I mean- Can we get a glass of whiskey quickly? Can we get a glass of whiskey quickly? Right? <laughs> We're giving Tim a whiskey break. <laughs> Also, I just want to say while um, Tim was talking, Habiba reminded me that Tim has recently been made a fellow of the Royal Society, which is kind of a big deal. <laughs> and we are very excited about it. Congratulations, Tim. Oh, He's not sorry. seeing us, so we have to say congratulations again. It, it is a big deal. I'm um, congratulating you, Tim, on your FRS. Mm. That's what we are congratulating. It was pretty cool. I signed. I signed. I, I signed the same book that Newton signed. That was pretty cool. Nice. Uh, well, it, it's richly deserved. I mean, that's yes. absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Fun, fun. All right. So uh, uh, maybe John, do you want to start? Just because there was uh, some interactions also. 
Yeah, I mean, I do just, I mean, it's so rich and there are so many things that, you know, I, my head is spinning, to be honest. Um, with is, but, it, is it spinning with attractors, lots of attractors going round and round? Yeah, well, <laughs> so, Tim, I, you know what's really interesting about this? I mean, there are two, I think, separate deep issues at play here, right? One is the Sherringtonian versus, you know, Hopfieldian in terms of the construction of the system. Yeah. Right. And understanding it. Um, the other one is the implicit way of a mouse solving the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and can you you're, you're 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 zooming in and out? Is it me or is it you? I can hear you very well, but maybe you can't hear me. I hear you both perfectly, and you're both perfectly fine. Other than John froze right now. Yeah, John's just suddenly gone. Well, <laughs> uh, maybe I'll take some questions from the. I mean, there's a lot of us who usually ask questions, but let's wait for John to come back yeah. for a second. Or maybe, I don't know. So did you guys do any lesion studies yet? No, we want to do holography. Oh. We want to go and I'm not sure how informative a lesion is going to be or a simple opto of the frontal cortex. Like I'm sure if they. I'm sure you'll get an effect, but I'm not sure how informative it's going to be. What you would need to do, like Mohammedi has some amazing plans for this. What you need to do is be able to selectively um, put activity or remove activity from one of those attractors and not the other ones. And then you can like control where the animal is going to be in many seconds time. That's the kind of thing that, you, that we'd like, that we, we should be able to do, hopefully at some stage. Um, but um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if, if that's uh, that's a that's a, a pro an ongoing project. Yeah, the um, I, the I mean, I think I obviously, ask... yeah. Sorry, the reason I ask is because I want to see whether, for instance, this could be happening at different stages. Can it learn the task without the PFC? Can it after it's learned the task already a couple of times? Can it still do it when the PFC is off? Like these are different things to ask, right? Because it could be that. Uh, after a while of doing it uh, very often, it's there. And then the other question that I have uh, is, so schema, there, there's a lot of schema that I have, but currently the schema that is active in my head is not an airport schema because I'm not in an airport. It's also not like, let's say, a restaurant schema because I'm not in a restaurant. Um, these schemas supposedly go and live somewhere else while I'm busy loading other schemas at the time right now and I keep loading different ones. Have you considered looking at where these neurons project so that one can potentially answer finally this question of how different schemas are kind of loaded into the frontal lobes? Yeah, or constructed somehow. Yeah, like I think that the implicit criticism is right, right? The implicit, the implicit criticism is, is, is that really, Although it is, a, and it's the same implicit criticism that John had, right? Although, although it's a, uh, a, a, a quite a complicated thing we've asked the animals to do. Obviously, they could just learn a manifold for this. For you could, they could learn that they could learn this particular representation, right? And they, and then, and then they, um, uh, they just activate that music box and play it every time they're in that context. And Bob's your uncle, and that's really all the mice do. Whereas Really, the question is how do you construct that thing on the fly when tomorrow you'll be in a restaurant and the day after you'll be, yeah, that's really the deep question. And that was kind of why I was interested in showing you the human data at the end, which is so exciting, which shows that that same representation is constructed on the fly in um, uh, in that same situation. So, I mean, sorry, I, I, John, predictably, Ida has just rephrased your question in a more, in, in a more intelligent way. Um, which is good. Um, oh. <laughs> but, uh, thank, well, wait, wait, John, let, John let, let's let this round kind of come to conclusion because yeah. when you dropped yeah. out, I asked questions. So I just want to see. So I ask whether, so the schema usually are, they live supposedly in some lateral uh, temporal regions and then they kind of get loaded into PFC or they get kind of constructed at the time. So we're asking, I'm asking about that and Tim is responding. So Tim, go ahead, please. What so like 
I, I, yeah, trying to ask answer both John's and your question with the same answer. The criticism implied is that there's just a learned representation, A, B, C, D, that they learn for ages and it's no better than having a manifold. I, like that that seems like a reasonable criticism to me of this task. I I and really the thing that you'd like to do is to const is to understand how they constructed a new one. So in some senses, that's why I showed that human data at the end, um, because they constructed that. That wasn't learned. They constructed that representation on the fly. Very likely, what they constructed it out of was the the more abstract representation in the entorhinal cortex. You just said, Ida, that they that that that, that you have the schema in the temporal lobe, and they load it into frontal cortex. I think that's what I've just showed you at the end there. That the the thing that's in temporal lobe is a very different thing from what's in frontal cortex. It's a it's the pure it's the knowledge schema, right? The understanding of a loop A B C D A B C D A B C D that is not in the frontal cortex. That's in the temporal lobe. That's the knowledge that's there. But then when they what I'm showing you is how that gets loaded into frontal cortex to solve this loop task in this particular thing. That's 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 this music box and that's what that's the, that that is how the that representation is not just what is a loop in in terms of knowledge that representation is how do you execute the loop in this task and it shows you precisely what action you should make at every step of your long chain of actions what action you should make it's, it's like it holds a ball in front of the mouse's face so you go here 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 uh, that's what's in the frontal cortex, whereas in the temporal lobe is this more abstract knowledge thing, the 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 understanding of what a loop is at all, right? That and those um, those two things note, are like. Tim, on that, but to follow up on that, Tim. I mean, that's what I meant by two different questions. One is, can I mean, you know, I would argue that, I and mean, that's not the Hopfieldian Sherringtonian distinction specifically, but. I would argue that what's cognitive is just what's in the temporal lobe. Oh, right. Right. And I would and I would say that what you've done here is you found an automatized, very clever, but there's nothing cognitive about a music box. It's a dumb construction. That's why right? I music to box get you to tell me what's Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's so, why no, I wanted but to what, get what you I'm just... saying is, No, but 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 you see, if if a human starts with the abstraction in the temporal lobe and then constructs a music box. To wait, 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 so, sorry, sorry, time out, time out. Yeah. We have not shown that the schema can be learned without the prefrontal cortex. So when you're saying these things, I'm not entirely sure that temporal lobe is actually responsible for all of the abstraction learning until there is an opto study that silences PFC, lets the animal learn the schema. So I don't think what the assumption that the temporal lobe has, has something more abstract that can be learned without pfc is necessarily justified at all that's not actually what i was saying i mean what i was just i agree i what i was saying is is that tim has made a distinction for the really abstract thing which is knowing what a loop is a b c d yeah he said that humans can do that really fast because presumably because they get it in the pure abstract sense yeah they can i suspect build a box really fast the mice yeah. have to learn it painstakingly, which means that they never, in the same way as a human, learn the pure abstraction, but they find a learning-related way to build the music box. Now, that is a distinction, uh, independent it of where a, it's, it's happening. And, I and don't I would actually say know. That... Let me just answer that before you go on. So I totally agree with you that that is a potential distinction. I don't know if that's true. I, I My suspicion is when we record an enterrhinal, we'll find the pure abstraction in the mice as well and those first days were not spent learning a music box but were spent figuring out what the fuck the rules were uh, and then inferring the the music box from there but i don't know i have no data for that but but the it's clear that those phase cells for example are the are going to end up being the structure of schema uh, uh, of whatever schema and some and by interacting those phase cells somehow constructing from those phase cells and other and other abstractions like the um like the uh the loop and physical space which are already abstractions 
So effectively, you can make a music box, not quite, but nearly, you can make the music box by just multiplying together in an outer product, phase cells, loop cells, and and um, spa and grid cells, right? If you, if you multiply those three things together in an outer product, you basically get a music box. It's a little different, but only slightly. Now, if you, like, 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 what those humans must have done is use language to figure that out and then make a representation immediately like that. That does seem like magic. I totally agree. But somehow, but, but, but I, 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 my suspicion is that that's also what the mice are doing. Well, that's just why, having a... why do you say that? But, but, but you, I mean, nothing that you've shown. I mean, what I thought you were saying is that there's a yeah. way to construct the music box through learning yes. without ever requiring the full abstraction. I don't think that, I, so I'm sure that is true. But if you're asking me to bet, I bet the mice have the abstraction. Well, then why don't they do it as fast? Learn... As, why don't they do it as fast as humans? Because the because we are very precise in how we instruct humans, but mice have to be instructed by trial and error. My, that we bet. The but the the. Um, uh, but doesn't that mean? But that doesn't that mean that once they've learned one, right? In other words, I I, I mean I understand. I mean just to, to be clear. I mean if I wanted to be really bitchy right i could say that the temporal lobe abstraction is hopfieldian and the yeah. music box in pfc is sheringtonian and then i would say that what you've got in the pfc is just a clever not reflex cognitive. and it's yeah, not cognitive exactly. anymore because you, because you've automatized I, it you've automatized it and there's nothing cognitive i mean you wouldn't say that a music box knows a song would you I mean, it's, I mean, I, 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 I'm not a philosopher. I don't know what knowing is. I, 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 that's why I asked you at the start whether the behavior was. No, I, was... I'm saying, I'm saying, I, I mean, it is a. Cognitive I agree behavior. with you that somehow what what the PFC is a, is a, it's like a cognitive habit. Like you used to talk to me about like the prefrontal cortex, learning stuff. When when you're going to do mo when you're going to learn stuff in as a motor habit, first you do something in the prefrontal cortex, which you get you kind of figure out the sequences in the frontal cortex first, and then you play them into the into the I, that's what i think we've we've got a representation for is it like it's like a cognitive habit i agree and that's whether you want to call that cognitive but then i suspect the, but i suspect that i could make a similar argument about the the um the temporal lobe in some other situation and you and you would then argue whether that was cognitive or not well, as well I, mean, I, think some, you, I think yeah but i think you did make yourself a distinction between humans a having the pure abstraction, being able to do it faster because they get it right, and yeah. then they finally converge with the mouse when you get into PFC. If that's true, so if, so, let, so, let, so in fact, what you would like a Sherontonian description of is not the final representation in the frontal cortex, nor the final representation in 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 the temporal lobe. You'd like the Sherontonian description of the series of events I have to replay from temporal lobe into frontal cortex in order to construct the frontal cortex representation from the temporal lobe representation. That's what you'd like me to solve in a Sherringtonian way. Is that, is that what you're saying? I, I mean, mean I'm, I'm happy to have a go at that, by the way. What, what, what we're doing here, <laughs> just uh, we're conflating um, Sherringtonian versus Hopfieldian with respect to what's truly cognitive and what is just cash cached mm -hmm. cognitive or habitual. And I don't think that's fully fair to you because they're not synonymous. Right. But I just wanted to ask you, I mean, I, absolutely fascinating. I mean, I, I think what the real thing for me on the cognitive versus non-cognitive, is it really true that the mice have the true abstraction? And that's an open question. I think you'd agree. We can definitely, that, that, that uh, beautifully, that is a question that we really can test as well. We can just stick probes in interinal and see what happens in interinal in the mice. Yeah. Well, which is, second, which I think though, second was, what, now, second is what I'm trying to understand. And, you know, David might be able to chime in as well is, when you say Sherringtonian, what it seems to me is you read, you said the word readout at one point. In other words, you can look at single cells and you can construct this. But that's not the same as how the connectivity in the prefrontal cortex constructs the ring attractor. In other words, I'm just trying to understand whether you're reading out a certain computation because and you're being able to use neural data to make your case. But do you really think that those neurons are doing it themselves or they're just a readout of what's been conferred upon them based on the network that they're embedded in? So 
that's what I'm trying what to understand. Asking. You're asking is it this correlation versus causation? Like obviously we can we can we can do causal tests of this thing, but the the the, the, the if the question is like like there are there are cells there that are basically place cells that fire. I'm just gonna be go to that place right now, right? Maybe if we stimulated those cells, the animal wouldn't go there. We don't know the answer to that question. Like, let's assume, let's do the thought experiment, which is the real experiment will happen, but let's do the thought experiment and say, I could just stimulate the A base cell. The animal goes to A, right? Like, I, I bet that will happen, by the way, but, let, but let's assume that happens. Now let's do the thought experiment. I stimulate the A the a, the lagged a play cell the one that is two rewards away now the animal just potters around doing what it's doing but in two rewards time about 20 seconds later it goes to a right that that's the kind of evidence that you that like i i think you're i think the point that you're making is just the like is it is it have you got causal evidence yet and the answer is like no we've got correlative evidence so far but like if that's the yeah that, we, that this conversation can end like you, no, no, no. I wasn't that. just saying that. I, I wasn't just trying to say that. I was just trying to say, you know, are place cells the things that are used to do the navigation versus they are the and in, you know in the Whittington sense they are the marker that this computation is going on, and you can read out the place matters. And I'm just not. So for I, me. I, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I obviously, obviously the correct answer to that question is a causal manipulation, which we haven't yet done. And so I can't honestly tell you the answer to that. But I can, uh, but like, I can say that the, the representation seems so, it seems like it's so unusually perfect for the frontal cortex that it seems, I, I would be extremely surprised if the causal manipulation doesn't work. If, if we go and stimulate those things, like you can predict 20 seconds before the animal makes a choice what choice it's going to make like so I, my last I would question, be... so i get it i get it you're right i mean i guess what i'm really asking what's amazing about this result and it really is amazing is that here's a task that can be thought of structurally like a music box or a series of ring attractors what's amazing yeah. Is prefrontal, I mean, why prefrontal cortex, by the way? Do you think the prefrontal cortex is like neural plasticine or wood or Lego? No, no, I think prefrontal cortex, no, 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 not at all. No, prefrontal cortex's job is to take simple behaviors and make complicated behaviors out of them. It's It solves that job because it's, because it, so it has to sequence, like if you may have lesions to frontal cortex, you like do your shopping in the wrong order and that kind of stuff. Like you can't structure sequential long I mean, that's obviously why frontal cortex in this task is because the, the job of this task is to sequ sequence long behaviors out of short behaviors that's what frontal cortex basically does and um, my take on that maybe the most interesting contribution here isn't even the music box it's those phase cells which are like encapsulating what one action is amongst this large larger set of actions such that you can then structure more complicated actions out of those simple actions yeah that's why frontal cortex because you know jun tanji in premotor cortex showed cells that knew exactly where they were in an order independent of what they were yeah right so in other yeah, words exactly it, it seems to me are you saying that there's a cognitive habit that can be constructed out of knowing abcd and that you can build that habit in prefrontal cortex I think um, in some I mean, senses this I mean, it feels like a habit, right I mean it just, feels it, like a cognitive habit because it's only slightly abstract like I like I I wonder if going to a restaurant is also a cognitive habit John it's just a slightly more abstract one like I wonder if like like do you see what I mean like like you know what's going to come next it's like a cognitive habit it, it you don't have to think about it like it it, it it that's why I, there was some debate in, at the start about what the nature of cognitive was is like going to a restaurant and, and acting appropriately a cognitive a cognitive uh behavior or not for me this this is like it's so far along the like this, i agree with you that it's procedural but it's only procedural after you know what the representation is right that's why i asked you before you knew what the representation was 
whether it was procedural. Because, my last like, point, just, it, so, that so, last wait, wait, point, I mean, yeah. Ida made the point in the question. I, well, I guess what I really like to know is, is this procedural cognitive habit, which you beautifully demonstrated, did it in the mouse come first? From the uh, pure abstraction. We do not know the answer to that yet. We don't know the answer and to that yet. Has huge implications for Melanie and AI is what I think is really getting interesting is that even the most cognitive things have their procedural version, right? And I wonder whether in mice or in machines, you can get to the procedural version without having to go through the pure abstract version first. And I wonder yeah. what humans do is that they have a little bit of a shortcut, you called it language, whatever, where they can build the cognitive habit fast through a linguistic or shortcut. And they need the abstraction as well as the language, right? Like if the, those and I'm just saying that really, been... and all I'm asking, yeah, do you need it? All I'm saying is, do you ever do you, is there a way through trial and error learning to get there without ever having to have oh, yeah, the yeah, yeah. no no but, you could you could build that music box without the without definitely you could build that music box without the abstraction no question the the question the in, i think that music box by the way like you can prove mathematically it's the optimal representation for this task so uh, i i think that you so so uh you can click so clearly some kind of reinforcement learning whatever could learn that music box however if you the animals learn that music box with sort of 10 or 15 examples right if you train a meta rl like zebs and matt botvinnik's it's going to take 10 or 15 thousand examples right uh, the, the question is like what why have they learned it off 10 or 15 instead of 10 or 15 thousand maybe it's just the phase cells maybe they have the pure loop abstraction like we'll fight we can find the the answer to those, like, yeah, exactly. So it's it's not like a human, they learn it in a, a minute, but it's way faster than AI would learn it. Like AI in that situation will learn it, will, it yeah, exactly. It's like, it's like orders of magnitude faster than AI will learn it. And so they must have something other than just pure reinforcement learning, yeah, exactly. Although not LLMs, because there you just give a system prompt and it behaves exactly like the task that you want. So there, yeah. you, that's zero shot, unfortunately, like at, that when you go to 100 trillion neurons. But uh, Tim, I have still just some questions. So I think a lot of the loops that happened, the rings that happened in the conversation were variations of situations where you would need to do some opto in order to figure out whether it's possible to learn if when the pfc is off does it just take longer or does it not learn at all etc so a, a lot of those things for retrieval after it's learned when enterinal is off can the pfc not load it or can it still do it after it's been learned if the enterinal is off can it still do it if pfc is off so it would be interesting to see all of these things i hope I, we will see that but uh, something that i'm still wondering is the process of learning whether you look at the uh, time course and it's possible to look at the role of different re regions as the rodent is learning the schema maybe the first time. And the question here yeah. is whether, who is first? Who comes first here? Obviously something needs to happen with this fast associative learning in the temporal lobe, but at some point from the medial temporal lobe or whatever else is getting involved, at uh, some point, a uh, PFC starts to do something. What does it do? Does it just point, hold something as a pointer of something more abstract so that they can do something or learn something else? How does the schema get formed the first time around? Does it get formed in PFC and then loaded back into internal cortex? Does it get learned there and loaded back up? Because I, I think it's PFC might play a more active role in the learning depending on the abstraction of the task, but I don't know what is the level of abstraction that PFC needs to kick in, maybe just to even hold something and say, hey, I'm going to hold this matrix, go learn that other thing, I'll put them together, something like that. So what do you think? I, yeah, go on. I think if you legioned hippocampus enterinal after they know the task, after they know the schema, then, then, then they, they either wouldn't need it at all, or they would only need it to load the bumps into the attractors that would be my guess maybe play cells load the bumps into the attractors or maybe you don't even need hippocampus enter to load the, load the bumps in the attractors and maybe you could just execute the entire task without hippocampus after you've learned the schema i agree with john 
that there's an extremely rich and interesting question about how hippocampus interacts with frontal cortex whilst the schema is being learned. Either it just plays out old experiences and frontal cortex learns from those old experiences um, that uh, and has some like algorithm in order to, which just picks up the music box and it's all kind of boring in that case then the reason it's learning faster than a deep net is that it already has some clever basis functions for example cells for space but also these phase cells that i think are going to be basis functions for making complicated behavior out of simple behaviors right and so like it, it starts off so we know so to answer your question like mohammedi has been recording from the first day of training and those phase cells are there on the very first day of training so they're like a basis function in frontal cortex a little bit like maybe the grid cells are a basis function in trinal cortex and they're like maybe they're just like a way of structuring short-term behavior into long like small behavior into into rich large behaviors right so, Wait, that's so like, you're saying so you're saying from day one some of these phase cells in the pfc might be acting as a glue that is piecing together shorter stu shorter stuff it into a lets you define, so it lets you define so even one of those sub goals is a long sequence of actions right but it, instead of learning about each part of the sequence separately, it's like an option in RL, right? Like instead of learning about each one of those pieces of, it, it knows what its goal is. It calls that an action, and then it sequences long, like like long sequences of actions from there. That's going to massively increase the speed of learning. But it's still a bit boring, in John's word, because you're still actually doing the learning of the music box by gradient descent. Right? That's one possibility. Another possibility is that it knows the pure abstraction of a loop it recognizes it's in a loop and then it, in the hippocampus it combines space and loops in some intricate way and it plays out the music box into frontal cortex that is another mm -hmm. possibility that i think is real in both a mouse and a human i think that must be true in the human by the way because they learn it so quickly um uh, and uh, and then the question is what sequences or what particular activities do you need to play out from the uh, the pure abstraction to make the music box, but I think that that's also a solvable problem, right? I think that we we un we can understand that just by looking at the structure of those two representations. Um, yeah, exactly. Yes, sec second point. So when I am here again, the, the schema of airport and restaurant are not even in my medial temporal lobe. They are probably consolidated somewhere in the lateral temporal lobe. And then when I go to an airport, probably they get loaded into my frontal uh, uh, temporal kind of loops. However, um, do you think that PFC is the main one and then the, the hippocampus or medial temporal lobe participates and internal cortex? Or do you think that these things are first loaded in the medial temporal lobe and then send uh, and then kind of like the, the, the basis sets or various kinds of things form in the PFC. And then I have another question after this, but I want to hear the answer. I don't know. I can't. I don't think I can give a, like a reasoned answer to that, to that question. I don't I just don't know. I understand the question. I understand that it's an interesting question. I don't think there's any data out there that would distinguish those those different options. Like, yeah, I just don't I just don't know. I, I agree you know with you. Retrieval, you know, right? It's like retrieval of schema. It's yeah, exactly. And I just don't. It's it's well. There's a retrieval and there's a construction question. Yeah. I don't think there are any useful data uh, in the world so about what yeah. the neural representations of for the retrieval or construction of new schemas are. I just I just think it's such a new kind of area of neuroscience that those options exist. They're sensible options. It's a good question. I just don't. I can't give you a sensible answer that is any different right. to one you. Know. As yeah. to the things that already exist, though, so there is perspective memory has been around for many decades now. And um, perspective memory is this idea that while I'm doing something right now, and this is some stuff that I did during my PhD as well, when you're yeah. even doing an abstract task right now, but there is another abstract task that you're supposed to do next, I could decode from anterior prefrontal cortex what the next task is going to be. I could both yeah, decode definitely. if the task was in 15, 20, or 30 seconds away. 
and yeah. uh, also whether it was uh, I needed to keep endogenous track of time and then switch or if there was an event in the world that told me now you need to switch and I had to decide what I was going to do. In both yeah. cases, it was in the most anterior parts of PFC that rodents don't have an uh, analog floor and then it would move backwards. But these are abstract tasks. When it comes to more simple tasks, I wonder whether what you're describing is maybe the same thing as what was happening that they had observed in rodent behavior. I think there's a 2013 paper on prospective memory in rodents. And we had observed in humans and you know the prefrontal cortex is involved. UCL has a lot of folks who, has work, who have worked on prefrontal cortex and uh, prospective memory. I wonder whether some of the things that you're seeing it's just basically little little prospective memory cells that are just keeping track of what's the next thing. And then those little next things are each of them uh, are then they are told downstream to the hippocampus. Now it's time for this or to the medial to enteral cortex, which is a little bit of a different story if it's working in that way, as opposed to the most abstract thing just being there. So this is in your favor. This would say that there is something cognitive happening in the prefrontal cortex. And that is to keep track of the next abstract thing that needs to be loaded in the back, top down, in order for it to be working. So, um, I, 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 again, I, I don't know quite what the what the responses would look like for those cells. But the the interesting thing about these responses is that um, they're not just coding for the next thing. They're on a position on the music box some of them code for the things you're going to do four and four away some of them code for the things you're going to do three away some of them code for the thing and they're all and they mean and the activity passes around these things so they're holding on so you, you are permanently keeping track of when you're going to do this thing right so there's a cell that says i'm going to do this thing in like i'm going to like pick my I'll be, there'll be a pick my nose cell but there'll be another pick my nose cell in two things time right that's what's happening here and so it isn't like a cell that says in i'm gonna i'm so it's yeah so it's not like this is the next thing and there's a sort of sim fire chain of a sequence of of things there's the cell is attached to the action itself but it's attached with a lag or it's attached to the the behavior itself it sounds like perspective lag. memory and, exactly that's maybe, what i'm I mean, not maybe there are models yeah. Maybe the, I mean, I don't know. Maybe there, are, maybe it's all the same as perceptive memory in some way, but it feels like a very mechanistic way of implementing this behavior. Yeah, to me. and I, it's I, also I've not seen. Yeah, I, I mean, like maybe I've missed the literature. Cool. But it's also between prefrontal cortex and the um, MTL. Like that field is also the same. And I'm saying that this is in your favor in the sense that the PFC would be cognitive in the sense that it would be coordinating what's gonna happen next basically. So all the information about the bigger sequence is not entirely possible. So the hypothesis would be, is not entirely possible in the uh, MTL alone. The PFC is basically like a conductor, like an orche is orchestrating the next kinds of things. And it's sending backwards these downstream things that's telling the uh, what to load and what the rest of the brain need to do. So I think in that sense, it's not, not cognitive, if that makes uh, sense. Maybe. I mean, I, I, I also guess, I mean, if you're asking me to take a bet on this, I guess I could just remove the temp after they've learned, after they know the task, I'm guessing I could, I could just remove the temporal lobe and they, they'd be I agree. Fine. Uh, I agree. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Um, so I don't think it's, yeah, I don't think it's about instructing the next memory. I feel like they are just loading the next action oh. into this. Wait, but there's two things that the PFC would need to do. It would have to send something downstream in order to generate the action at the end of the day. That's how task sets work. You know, PFC would just yeah. send something downstream. And sending that something downstream could require hippocampus for navigation. So if you turn off MTL, it might not work, not because it's uh, necessary for just, the schema thing, just, just because be clear, the Ida, Just to be clear, this, I don't think there's any navigation required once you've got this. This music box, doesn't tell you where the next reward is. It tells you where the next movement is, right? It's it's got everything. It stores every single holds a ball in front of the animal's nose and goes here, 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 here. Not tell you where the next reward is. It tells you the very next action. My sister. Sorry, wait, 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 wait. Can just say 
so you're you're using language but it, obviously in the brain of a mouse it's not telling or it's not something outside it's sending some projections backward to somewhere else in the brain for instance to motor cortex to premotor cortex etc in order yeah, to exactly. guide and but it's not in order to guide actual exactly. navigation behavior in the world which is it has to move from it's this a, yeah but what i'm saying now is it's not sending a, a remote reward location which the hippocampus and neuronal cortex has to figure out how to get there it's no, that's not what I thought either. Neck. That's not what I thought either. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah, not what I exactly. thought either. So I'm saying that yeah, these are small, but in that way, PFC is still cognitive and that it is guiding the rest of the brain how to generate the next dumber behavior. Yeah, no, 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 I agree. I don't know what the definition of cognitive is, by the way, but <laughs> I, I mean, I like some people say cognitive is anything that holds information over time and stuff like that. Like clearly it's, it, it, it meets all of those definitions of cognitive. Like I was worried that, that John was going to say, oh, a music box isn't cognitive. And therefore that's why I asked him to, the, whether the task was cognitive at the start, because like once you've seen the representation, it feels mechanical, not cognitive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it, it's interesting. Anyway. So next we have Melanie, and then I'll invite David so that David can ask his questions after Melanie as well, if that's okay. Because I have more questions, but we don't. We're running out of time, so I want to definitely make sure Melanie and David ask questions. So, Melanie, please go ahead. No, I'll be I'll be really quick. I mean, I just wanted to push back on this notion of a pure abstraction, which is a term that came up, and I don't really know what it means. Um, you know, I think abstraction is has is on a sort of continuum the the mice the mouse that you were showing you know learned this task on i think it was a three by three grid that's yeah. moving around on uh that i can't remember exactly but you know clearly if it has the abstraction of a loop it, it should be able to do the same thing on a four by four grid or or and, and you know we humans i don't think mice probably could do this but we certainly can transfer our notion of loop from spatial to say musical yeah. or some other more you know completely different uh kind of task but um so i don't know what you you mean exactly when you're talking about this notion of, of yeah, so, pure abstraction so, and how you so would probe it two things yeah. to know one is that the mice can generalize beyond three by three if you give them a new uh, this speaks a little bit to, to to John's point about whether they've just learned it by gradient descent. If you put a new tower in there, you can zero to that new tower as well. So they know they've done something compositional with space. But the, the, when I was talking about pure abstraction, I was um, uh, I was drawing a distinction because the frontal representation clearly is not a pure abstraction, as John noted, right? The frontal representation, the loopiness is are tied to spatial locations. So it's not, it, I, I'd be extraordinarily surprised if the frontal representation did generalize to any other task other than this one. I'm, I would think they would have to build a new version to, for a new task. However, on the very final slide, I showed that Habiba had found that the entorhinal cortex has a different kind of representation, it just knows nothing about space at all only knows about the abstract loopiness my suspicion is that that representation would generalize to any loop that you that you gave the animal i think that because of some other data in humans we have as well that data was from humans and so the animal is a human in this case um but uh, <laughs> um but um i uh, i wonder whether the mice have that pure abstraction so what i'm saying is there's a there are cells that just track where you are in a loop not tied to space not tied to anything one cell for a one cell for b one cell for c one cell for d in the entorhinal cortex very different from that whole of the rest of the talk I, where i was talking about this complicated interaction between the abstract loopiness uh, and space which is what you see in the frontal cortex exactly and so um, I am prepared, although maybe I'll be, just, maybe you'll castigate me for doing so, but I'm prepared to say that that, that entorhinal representation that Habiba has me measured is really a pure abstraction of a loop. It doesn't know anything about where you are in space. It only knows where you are on the loop. And my, my guess is that one will generalize to any loop. Uh, that'd be my guess. 
Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, like we're talking about what is cognition and all, and I, I don't know either, but part of it is that ability to take, to figure out which schema yeah. applies to the current situation. Yeah, and that, that's what the humans did so beautifully. Right? And that's the humans really... like immediately solved this problem. And yeah. then they made, but not only did they immediately solve this problem, but they made that same music box representation in the frontal cortex when they did it. Yeah, exactly. And I'll just say that, you know, it's a brilliant abstraction to kind of map a music box onto the brain. And that's something that a mouse would never do. Well, yeah. <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> but while David is coming, just to follow okay, up I'll, on what Melanie was saying, do you think it's abstraction or is it receiving these things, reading these things downstream from PFC? Oh, is it is the enterrhinal reading receiving the loop of stuff stuff? from the PFC? It's just reading a lot of things and it can't distinguish them the way PFC does. Hey, David, but it's actually not. Oh. Uh, but it's actually not uh, the most abstract one. It's just like reading out or receiving some information from PFC. Like the projection study would um, help with this. My, my, my bet is that my bet is that the like grid cells have a local network and enterrhinal to maintain uh, the notion of a torus, which which defines two dimensional geometry. My bet is that there's a similar a set of attractors in the in the in the temporal lobe, which uh, which maintain the understanding of 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 a repetitive loop. Uh, my bet is that my, my bet is that that is extremely important for animal life. Day night, day night, day night, month, week, 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 week. Repetitiveness, uh, uh, and my bet is that that loop abstraction is a real thing in entorhinal cortex or in the temporal lobe. Uh, and it's there in the same way that the grid cells are there, maintained by a local circuit. My bet is that then if you want to recognize that this task involves that local circuit, you're going to need your frontal cortex to go and activate the right local circuits in temporal lobe uh, to do that recognition. That would be my bet. Yeah, exactly. That's a good one. So, David, we have your, vi uh, okay. we have your video. I think if you try... If you try to speak, now you muted yourself, now you're unmuted. Do you want to say something? Do you, oh, he doesn't hear me. He lost audio and video. He has lost audio. We hear you. Ask. I can't see or hear uh, anyone. Um, okay, I can. Uh, I suppose I'll, I'll ask the question. Um, I, I think an important, um, uh, excellent. So uh, beautiful work, first of all. Um, I, um, I'm not sure if this is Sherringtonian or Hopfieldian um, and regardless it's beautiful work. So um, in some sense, um, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm the sure quality of explanation uh, will change. Whether it's one or the other, I think an important element of the task is to get very clear computationally what's going on. So what are the uh, representations that are needed to solve the task and, and how do those representations need to be transformed to give rise to the behavior? Um, and obviously there's gonna be a series of, of, of transformations and representations and assigning representational content, for example, to the drum controller uh, that seems to be um, implemented by the medial frontal cortical neurons um, is going to, you know, uh, uh, require understanding what the contents are. Is it representational? Is going to require getting clear about those transformations, getting clear about what the contents could be. Um, so, is it computational is an interesting question for me, uh, or is it merely just some sort of um, m something non-representational, some motor planning or something like this, uh, which maybe is sometimes representational, sometimes not. Um, that question though is orthogonal to the sort of sharing to nature, Hopfieldian nature, uh, cause there could be manifolds, there could be these dynamical systems that are non-representational. The latter 
question about whether or not it's Sherringtonian, it seems to me, is going to turn on some points that John made about whether or not we have this node-to-node -node kind of connectivity uh, for the information processing operations that we think are going to be implemented. But also, it seems to me that what's been, been uncovered, uh, especially your point, Tim, that 80% of the neurons show this kind of um, selectivity. It's really a kind of univocal selectivity as opposed to a mixed selectivity. Once we've landed on the right set of variables, we're able to, to, to well describe a very large fraction of the population, which I think is great. Um, uh, but it, that alone doesn't necessarily mean it's Sherringtonian or Hopfieldian. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised. What, what would make it sort of interestingly Hopfieldian is if this kind of drum controller that you've uncovered evidence for really needs to be understood and ultimately in manifold terms in order to give rise to sort of the full aspects of the behavior. Um, and, and I'm not sure if that's true or not. Um, and it will probably require not just finding this kind of system in this one task, but looking and see how well it generalizes and, and, and similar sorts of, of considerations. Um, so, you know, I, I guess my main question is just, did you computationally model the behavior in a way where you're able to um, sort of assign contents to what you think the operator is doing? Or do you really think it's, it's a purely mechanical process one where you don't even need to talk about um, content uh, or assign content to those uh, neural activities. Can you hear me? I think he probably can't hear you. So David, you may need to go off stage to hear us. So let's wait until maybe, oh, Melanie's back. <laughs> maybe. And yeah, David maybe. is going off stage. Exactly. Let me, yeah, he's going, he's gone off stage. So now maybe he can hear it. Let us know so, when you hear us. Yep. Uh, first question is the drum manifold versus, versus, the neurons the reason i thought that it was the reason i think i don't know whether i don't know whether these words sharon tony and hotfieldian are, are going to end up being the right ones to describe this distinction but 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 um the reason the thing that's different about this to me from a lot of the work that's been that i've played with frontal cortex in the past other other people is not just the a number of neurons which which is the respond there which is unusual for me but the um the fact that you can prescribe every single neuron's role in an overall description of the mechanism every neuron plays a role you know what that neuron's role is and if you wanted to although obviously we cannot measure the synaptic connectivity between all of those neurons but i could draw a circuit diagram and i could place every one of those neurons in that circuit diagram with no problem at all and it would play the behavior at the end of it uh, this this is um as close to neuron connects to neuron they're producing behavior that i have ever been in the frontal cortex that's why i made this provocative title right i can easily anybody who's here who's understood the what the representation could draw that circuit diagram just as you asked David and they could put every neuron in a place in that circuit diagram that that is different I think from what you could do if it was a manifold and that's why I, I, there's no claim that's true of any other cognitive behavior from this I, I agree it doesn't generalize to other cognitive but that's it's like but it's something I haven't had before right it's like okay look we can take what appears to be a complicated behavior and describe it neuron by neuron and, and, and end up with, a, with something that, that produces that behavior. That's definitely true. What's, um, uh, what's, uh, whether a computational model of that, so there's obviously models and there's theories. Um, Will Dorrell and James Whittington who've worked on like principles underlying representations and why they should 
be should 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 look the way they do um have uh, some really fun uh basic theoretical constraints published recently about uh why grid cells look the way they do and why cells why things appear in single neurons not in mixed selectivity when they do the two recent papers that are both at ICLR next week that you can get on archive that are fun uh, about that and I can tell you that if you apply those same theories to this task you get the music box representation if you apply them to space you get grid cells if you apply them to like um if you apply them to um uh like uh, variational autoencoders, you get factored representations in those. Uh, but in but if you apply them to this task, you get the music box. So there's the same underlying computational principles uh, that, or like representational principles, uh, predict this music box that predict um, that predict grid cells. If you think that means it's a representation, uh, I, I don't really know what philosophers mean when they say representation. By the way. Uh, but uh, but uh, that's my that's all I do know about this this one. Um, but the reason I was provocatively coming on here to have an argument with you guys is because it's unlike mixed selectivity. It's unlike I've got a manifold, and I in so far as every cell plays a role, we know what that role is in building the the we, we can place it in this in the circuit diagram that produces the behavior. That it, certainly, I've, I've never been in that position before with any data set in the frontal cortex. So, um, Tim, I have to go because I have to go down to the mean. But I just had a, it's fantastic. But I just on that point, are you saying this is an exception that proves the rule? In other words, have you surprised yourself in finding a circuit diagram in prefrontal cortex? Well, it's um, or, it, or, or, it, or do you or do you think? That you've come up that there's going to be a circuit diagram that the manifolders didn't realize was lurking there and if they do what you guys do is every cognitive behavior will fall to a sherringtonian diagrammable circuit or is this just a weird out i think i think that you, we won't make a circuit for language, right? Because we don't understand that we'll never understand the behavior enough. But I think that I think that this idea that we're lost and we have to go for manifolds is cheating. I think that we have that the that there's still power in trying to find the right invariances in neurons. And if you try to find the right invariances in neurons, you'll learn something. I think that if you just give up on understanding how biology tried to align the manifold with the neurons, which is effectively what you're doing if you say, I'm just not going to bother looking at single neurons. Neuro Biology's made a decision to try to, it's made a decision about which neurons to put its manifolds in and why. And I think that if you don't try and understand that decision and you just do a PCA, then you're cheating. I think it's fine to cheat, by the way. I, I, I think it's still interesting. There's plenty of interesting things you can do in manifolds. But it's but I, I think that the if we if we if we find the right axes to carve nature up on there will still be invariances in frontal cortex in the same way that there are invariances in, in medial temporal lobe in the same way that there are invariances with in in visual cortex and it will be extremely revealing to understand what the invariances are in frontal cortex in the same way that it has been in hippocampus and in the same way that it has been in, in visual cortex. That's what I think. Finding, just, 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 to, just to follow up, just so I understand what you're saying, do, do you consider finding invariances at the level of neurons synonymous with being able to draw a circuit diagram? No, definitely. It definitely is not synonymous with that. In some, in some cases, you can find the invariances and the circuit diagram, and that implies the behavior. That's the best thing you can do, right? I think uh, um, often you might find an invariance and then and then go, wow, that's an invariance. Seems like magic. Like, and th then that's neither Hopfieldian nor Sherringtonian. That's just like not quite understanding it. But <laughs> um, but you but you but 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 I still think you've done something cool by finding the invariance. 
I, I don't buy that this idea that the frontal cortex is just going to be a random projection or a massive mixture of shit. That I, I don't buy that idea. And um uh, and I don't buy the idea that we should give we should just assume that the best thing to do is a PCA and try to explain the trajectories. Like that I think those two things uh are will will put us will will, will not will, um, I think what happened get deeper than that. What happens, for example, when you have people like Juan Gallego and others who show the invariance at the level of the aligned trajectory, even though you can go for very many different neurons? In other words, you can apply it even to a different, another monkey brain, right? In other words, if you align, presumably the connectivity and the neurons are quite different, and yet you've got the same trajectory aligned across two monkeys, or you just go into a different set of neurons and you still find it. I think that what happens when you vary that I think level? What I think what they're finding and what Jeff Schoenbaum's finding and what we found with Veronica Samborska, maybe we've done that across, like a line across animals. I think that tells you what the natural modes of the task are beautifully. This is the, this is the natural dynamics of the task. I can align my neurons to the natural dynamics of the task, no problem at all. Biology still has to make a question about how it how it assigns those task dynamics to individual neurons, and if you choose not to address that question, that's your decision. But you're leaving data unexplained. I, I think you are, and I strongly suspect that it will be possible to explain that data too. And therefore, the more complete explanation will be the one that explains when individual neurons fire, not the one that explains the dynamics of the task. That is my that is my assessment of the situation. And they wouldn't just be second level explainers. I I, I think there will be intricate and interesting reasons, what mechanistic reasons, why biology chooses one of those alignments of the neurons to the factors, and not another. For example. Play cells and grid cells have the same principal components. If you were just to do a manifold analysis of play cells and grid cells, you would find the same representations. However, if you know how biology is chosen to align the neurons with the factors, you can find that the hippocampus is different from the entorhinal cortex because the hippocampus has sparse representations that can easily be bound into memories, whereas the entorhinal cortex has compressed representations that are good for schemas. And that they've got the same manifolds, the same task dynamics. The, the, the person that tries to align across monkeys will think a play cell and a grid cell is the same thing, right? However, because I, if you are prepared to understand why the nature chose to align the factors differently in hippocampus and in Toronto, you'll get some mechanistic insight into the computation in many cases, in my view. It's brilliant. You are that. That I. I think uh, that's a good point. Um, sure. and I think, and I think that's uh, very interesting. How generalizable that is, um, and mm -hmm. it, it is a real provocation. And uh, thank you. I found it really very inspiring. The work is just gorgeous. Um, and uh, I'm sorry it took so long uh, to explain it. It just always takes no, me a long time no, no, to explain no, no, it. No, it's intricate. There are a number of intersecting concepts and factors. Uh, one has to go slow, especially certainly for me. <laughs> and um, I think it was absolutely uh, fabulous. And even though it was my birthday, I don't feel as old as you think I am, darling. And I'm going to go now. <laughs> and uh, big hugs to you, Tim. Thank you. Ciao. Love you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, John. Tim, I agree with John. Like it, uh, it's true that it was different from our usual presentations. But if you would have gone faster, we would have completely I lost so the too, yeah. important intricacies of it. So I'm completely glad that you did it. How are you doing? Uh, because I know it's very late there. Stay, I just want to see how yeah, long. I can stay up. I'll be fine. If people, if people have questions, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to bow out. So we'll leave you got it. Perfect. Kim. So no, I'm, I'm just going to. Gonna, you, you had mentioned already. Thank you for thank you. Longer, this is fantastic. Thank you, Tim. Bye bye. Bye. My C. So maybe we take just a few questions from the audience, just because uh, they've stayed long enough until now. Is that I feel like that could be valuable. No, no, people are still here. <laughs> <laughs>
So maybe just we read two questions and then. Um, Let's go get another whiskey very quickly, given it's late. Okay. Uh, can you hear me while I read it or no? Just don't, don't you, uh, are you reading it or are you grabbing them on the screen? You know, we can also just, you can, you can also read them offline because like I know it's late ah. there. <laughs> How is the um, progress to sub goal computed? Yeah, this is the one, we don't know the answer to this question. Uh, w would the phase computation be normalized across only distance, not time? In other words, are you claiming whether, uh, no, so it, it's, it's, it's how far you are along towards the goal in the proportion. That's what, in the proportion, like if I'm halfway there um, uh, in, well, oh, is it distance or time halfway in distance? Well, those two things are so correlated, it's very hard to know, I don't know. But like as time and distance bend, uh, the phase cells bend with them, that does seem like a bit of a mystery to me, how that happens. And that's, that's, that's the magic that the PFC brings to this representation. Uh, we've got, in fact, we haven't got, I was going to say we've got ideas for how it happens, but they're not good ones yet. So I'm not even going to claim we've got good ideas for how to answer that first thing. That feels like the, 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 the biggest open question to me out of the whole thing. How do you get the phase cells? Um, and the yeah. final part is, are you claiming whether MPFC cells encode some normalized distance to sub-goal or normalized time to sub-goal? So in, in our task, it's almost impossible to dissociate those two things. So I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, exactly. So a great question is like perspective memory has event-based and time-based, and that should be dissociating those two things in the different mm -hmm. experimental paradigms that exist. Uh, second question from David. They say, I'm wondering what puts pegs in one of attractor wheels. Is firing tied to the four abstract goals, first goal, second goal, et cetera, for specific rewarded goal locations, A, B, C, D, or any of the nine locations? I'm wondering what, so um, the each, each location has a, a, a ring and whenever each ring has a, like a now cell, a readout cell, this is where I am now. Whenever you pass through that location, you stick activity in the now cell, and then that activity slowly goes around the attractor, such that in four rewards time, it comes back again, and that together makes the sequence, right? And so all you have to do is like imagining the music box, whenever you can imagine, imagine the, like the reverse music box, where you just play the note, and then put the peg in the place. And then it carries on going round, and that peg's going to come back to the and hit the note again next time round. That's, I think, how the thing works. Yeah. And then Elliot cool. Smith says, fascinating as usual. Curious whether Tim predicts as many as 80% of human M M M medial frontal cortex neurons, as in mice, do phase state encoding. In other words, are the ubiquity of these representations necessary for the task or setup uh, from overtraining? We'll have to catch the answer offline, but yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, I hope Elliot's going to answer that question by recording in medial frontal cortex <laughs> uh, in humans. Uh, but um, uh, so far, we recorded six neurons in medial frontal cortex in humans, and five of them have it. So that's wow. around 80%. <laughs> um, Didn't so, expect that. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know is the answer. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, Beaver says, what's the drum? Oh, yeah, exactly. So the exactly network connectivity makes the drum. And as the drum goes round, that's just activity going around the the, the, the attractors. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right, Beaver. So for so, people yeah, who the whole drum the is made up by the Yeah. Sorry, for people who didn't uh, you read the question in your mind. So I think I'm gonna just read it out loud. What is the drum in this analogy? Network synaptic connectivity. So they're asking that question. And uh, yeah. I think and Tim's answer is it is synaptic connectivity. Yeah, yeah, it makes so you can you can just build those attractors in the same way that you build a ring attractor. I don't know if you guys know about ring attractors, but you yeah. can build a ring attractor with, with connections and then you can just pass activity around the ring attractor. Yeah, exactly. And uh, Ayuno, also a regular at the Salon, asks, they say, so, so interesting, does this programmable music box imply finite combinations of bombs? Or will it try to fit anything and everything, i.e. any tasks, by going finer and finer between bumps? How does forgetting fit in this framework? Please ask Marie. 
So the first question is a complicated one that I would have to draw some diagrams to answer. It, it turns out that the, it, the anchors in this thing are not quite just space. I, I alluded to this quickly, but they're space times phase. It's actually a continuous attractor, not quite a series of attractors, where the phase is a continuous variable. And you can indeed make, in, you can, it can be done in continuous space, and I think it is done in continuous space. And the series of attractors is an, only an approximation to what the representation is, which is, a, which is uh, uh, like that axis of phase forms a continuous thing in the attractors. I don't expect you to understand that without a lot of diagrams. But I think the, the answer to your question is, because of that, the answer to your question is yes, it, it's, it, it, it can effectively fill in a continuous path. I don't, I, I, I don't have a better way of explaining that than saying I would need a pen and paper to draw it. Um, but uh, but you, maybe you can just believe me. It, what you're saying is, can it go finer and finer between bumps? The answer is yes. I think it can go finer and finer between bumps. Effectively, I think it can just hold a ball in front of the mouse's nose and say, "Go here, go here, go here, go here, go here," in a continuous way. That's, I think, what's what the one way of of doing it. And um, I think you're asking how does, the number of tasks finite or not? Oh, the number of tasks. No, as you say, num the number of tasks or the number of steps. So uh, they say, uh, will it try to it's fit? Finite com yeah, they're saying finite combinations of bumps. That means the number of steps is that finite. Well, and I think combination the of bumps would be a task. And then they are later clarifying in the parenthesis. Oh, I see. Yeah. They're I see. Saying, You're totally right. I Well, so the answer to that question is, uh, the number of tasks is clearly finite because there's only nine possible places in the four possible sequences so th that's clearly finite there's a number of, um I think but, in general not just in this task but in general how many total yeah, tasks yeah 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 I, yeah i don't i obviously don't know the answer to that, to, to, uh, to that question um uh, i think and then uh, a question i do know the answer to is more like like is it can it interpolate or extrapolate beyond in space uh, where it's going? Mm -hmm. uh, the answer to that question, I think, is yes. Um, uh, we have some evidence because we've given it, we've done tasks with new towers they've never seen before, and they can zero shot to those. And so there's some intricate generalizable representation of space in there. Um, but the um, uh, but but yeah, I don't know how many possible types of tasks could be represented in frontal cortex. Yeah, and the last one is, does the remapping of the state cells to different tasks have something to do with the physical activities that the animals have to do to go to go to the north? To the next uh, The remap? Yeah, I see. For so the remapping of the... Yeah, the remapping of state cells to different tasks... Well, maybe that was asked before I showed the music box, right? Because the, once you understand the music box, you understand where the remapping happens, right? It happens because the, they're tied eventually to the location, and the locations are different in different tasks, exactly, yeah. Thank you so cool. much, Tim. You have been amazing at explaining. And Anna, in, who's a philosopher in the chat, says, thank you, what an outstanding talent to explain difficult studies from neuroscience. I've caught myself smiling while listening. So thank you so much, Tim. It's been a I hope, I hope pleasure, as always. Be clear. It's been a cool. pleasure, as always. And uh, yeah, I hope to discuss this more. This looks exciting, and I feel like it's going to impact the field for the years to come. So I'm very excited to see it here. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. Thank you, everyone, yes, for your guys. questions. And see you soon. Have a great weekend. Bye. Bye.